Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Pohl. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here with us today, May 23rd, 2018, for our UNCCN Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture. A uh, few preliminaries I'd like to go over before we get started. Uh, you can email us with any questions or comments, uncn at unc.edu. And we have a wealth of different information on, uh, that, that you can find on our site at uncn.org. Uh, if you are having any kind of technical difficulty at all right now, uh, give us a call, 919-445-1000. If the audio isn't quite right, if the video isn't quite right, uh, let us know. We have technical folks standing by who can help you, so uh, don't wait. Call us now. Uh, we are having a little bit of a problem. We think it's network-related for some of the video conferencing units that we're trying to join in, especially those on campus. So uh, coming in via Zoom, uh, coming in via our uncn.org forward slash live link, any of those should get you in just fine, or call our team if you need help. All right. Uh, we will be using Poll Everywhere for Q&A today. Uh, you can go to, a web, to the website pollev.com forward slash UNCCN. You'll see the questions as they appear. You can go ahead and type in your answers. Uh, most of the people that, that join us via Poll Everywhere join via texting. So any uh, phone that's capable of texting may join us. And what you do is you type in the two field, the number 22333 in the message UNCCN. Just do that once, you'll get a message back that says joined, then you can go ahead and respond to the questions as, as they appear. And it will look just like this. Our icebreaker question for today is what is the one word that comes to mind when you think of acute myeloid leukemia? And this will be a word chart, so uh, go ahead and, and share with us what that would be, and we'll look at that in just a minute. All right, so our guest here today is Dr. Josh Zagner. So welcome, Dr. Zagner. Really Hi. glad to have you here today. Uh, let's see. I, I know a little bit about you from, from seeing you around uh, the, the, the grounds here. And I know uh, also from, from our bio information, you're an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and a member of the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. And how long have you been with us? July 1st will be four years, actually. Okay, great, great. All right, so an anniversary coming up. And you split your time between running clinical trials and seeing patients in the clinic and attending the E1 and E3 leukemia services. Right. Yeah. Clinical expertise in the management of patients with acute leukemia, uh, myeloid dysplastic syndromes, and myeloid proliferative neoplasms. And research focuses on drug development and early phase clinical trials in acute myeloid leukemia and myodysplastic syndromes, in which you were the principal investigator on six different clinical trials. Very excited about all of them. Well, we're impressed that uh, you found time in your schedule to, to meet with us today and, and to present to our Thanks. audience. Uh, what's something I left off the list? What, what's something our audience would, might want to know about you that wasn't there? Yeah, well, those of you that know me well know that I was in a rap group in high school, and I right. am a karaoke connoisseur. Wow. So those are some things that may not be in my bio. Yeah, yeah I didn't spot those there. I, and <laughs> I, I don't anticipate rapping, you know, the presentation, but uh, if you catch me you know, later on, we may be able to do some freestyle. Well, we'll be, we'll be ready just in case. <laughs> All right, very good. So uh, let's take a look at that uh, poll everywhere and see. So, again, the, this can be anything that... That uh, in, in one word that comes to mind: uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Elderly, so associating that with an older population. We'll wait. You know what I might do is is well, we'll give a few more seconds for that to come in, and I do have uh, our disclosure to read, so let me take care of that, and then we'll jump back to that slide. So this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development, UNCCPD. Dr. Thomas Shea consults for Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium, Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics. Dr. James Coghill, MD, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. The speaker, Joshua Zagner, MD, has received honoraria from uh, Celgene and Tolero, ending in 12, 2017, and receives research support from Merck, 
Millennium, Takeda, and Tulera. Did I do okay with the pronunciation <laughs> yeah, on those? I think so, yeah. All right, very good. Let's jump back. Uh, so not a lot of activity on our polls, but hopefully you will be thinking about questions that you have for Dr. Zeidner during the course of this lecture. Uh, he has a couple of questions interspersed, so be ready for those. And then uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A portion. So uh, acute myeloid leukemia, finally making progress, is the topic of, of your presentation That's today. Great. And I'm going to send that on your way so that you've got that. Well, thanks and the again. mouse as well, if you want to use that as a pointer. Yeah, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, again, the title of my talk is Finally Making Progress in Acute Myeloid Leukemia. And, uh, I hope I'm going to impress upon you that, you know, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what I think we can accomplish in this disease. And um, I'm going to be talking about some of the new agents that are approved in this disease and some agents in development. Um, so we went over my disclosures, so I'll skip that. Um, the objectives of today are to discuss the pathogenesis and etiology of AML, to discuss the diagnostic testing in AML, and to discuss the management of AML, both younger and older patient populations. I like the word elderly when someone thought of AML, as we'll get into um, certainly some of the elderly patient populations with this disease. Um, we're going to talk about some recent drug approvals, and I'm going to highlight some investigational agents in development. So first I thought I'd start off with a case, and this was uh, a patient of mine that I saw about a year ago. This is a 67-year-old male with a Past medical history is significant for stage 1 squamous cell carcinoma, the oropharynx. So he had head and neck cancer in 2015, which was early stage. And this patient received chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which was standard of care for his head and neck cancer. He didn't have any evidence of recurrence, um, but eventually presented with progressive fatigue, chest tightness, and went back to his local oncologist about two years after his original diagnosis of head and neck cancer and was found to be newly pancytopenic. His white blood cell count was 1.3, his hemoglobin was 7.8, and his platelet count was 69. Uh, a bone marrow biopsy was performed at that time, revealing 20% blast by manual aspirate differential with multi-lineage dysplasia. Cytogenetics revealed a highly complex karyotype, and next-generation sequencing mutational testing revealed a TP53 mutation. The patient was otherwise healthy, had a very good uh, ECOG performance status of zero, and the question is, um, well, let's move back here. Um, question is, what is the next step in the management of this patient? A, refer directly for an allogeneic stem cell transplant. B, 7 plus 3 induction chemotherapy. C, CPX351. D, azacitidine. Or E, 7 plus 3 plus mitostorm. So I guess we'll give few seconds here for um, people to answer. And, and just pick the letter A, B, C, D, E. Uh, all you need to do is submit that single letter, whichever one you think is correct. And it uh, looks, like, looks like we're running it. Uh, we're favoring B right now. And we will, up oh, neck and neck, B and E. Um, we will hopefully answer this question throughout the presentation. I'm going to ask this question again at the end, and hopefully everyone will get it correct. Uh, the hint will be that there are actually two, in my opinion, two correct answers. Um, B and E may not be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, we'll move forward, and um, we'll ask the same question at the end of this talk. So, so what is AML? Um, AML is a clonal proliferation of myeloid precursors in the bone marrow, and we term these cells myeloblasts. So what is a myeloblast? A myeloblast is the first cell produced within the myeloid lineage um, in the bone marrow, and myeloblasts are produced in normal, healthy individuals, but these myeloblasts rapidly mature and differentiate into White blood, mature white blood cells such as neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and macrophages. Um, in AML, these myeloblasts are produced at a rapid frequency, and they have a reduced capacity for cell death, which leads to uncontrolled cellular proliferation. And most importantly, these myeloblasts have a reduced capacity for differentiation, such that the bone marrow becomes filled with myeloblasts, and these myeloblasts cannot mature. So what is the pathogenesis of AML and how does AML arise? Uh, 
We, we do not know definitively how this disease develops in most individuals, but the standing hypothesis is that there is a mutation or an abnormality that occurs in a very early hematopoietic progenitor or stem cell that renders this stem cell leukemogenic. These leukemia-initiating mutations typically take the form of two different classes of mutations. In order for leukemogenesis to occur, we generally believe that there needs to be a mutation that A, confers a proliferative advantage, and B, impairs hematopoietic differentiation. And once the two types of mutations are present, that is necessary and sufficient to lead to acute myeloid leukemia. Now, when a, a, a early hematopoietic stem cell acquires these leukemia-initiating mutations, we term this type of cell a leukemia stem cell, and that is abbreviated as LSC. So anytime you see LSC in this presentation, that is referred to a leukemia stem cell, a hematopoietic stem cell that has acquired these leukemia-initiating mutations to become leukemic. Um, what are stem cells? Um, I think it's important to understand that stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, have three basic properties. Number one, they are not cell cycle dependent, and that is discordant from all other dividing cells in our body, which clearly are cycle dependent. Um, these uh, hematopoietic stem cells are capable of self-renewal, and they produce committed progenitor cells. So a scheme of how AML develops is the red and uh, purple uh, ugly-looking cell is a hematopoietic stem cell that has acquired these leukemia-initiated mutations, and that renders that a leukemia stem cell, or LSC. Eventually, this LSC gives rise to the clinical phenotype of AML with a lot of blasts, myeloblasts in the bone marrow, and these are the white circles. Um, chemotherapy is generally given to patients with acute myeloid leukemia and is largely effective at getting rid of the myeloblasts. So in this schema here, after conventional chemotherapy is given, a patient may achieve a complete remission where we do not see any myeloblasts present in the bone marrow. But unfortunately, these leukemia stem cells survive chemotherapy and ultimately lead to the recapitulation of this disease in, in the form of relapse, as shown at the end of this schema here. So to reiterate, stem cells are inherently chemoresistant, and it turns out that leukemia stem cells are not all created equal, and there, is, um, there are early and later stem cells that, are, that can acquire these leukemia-initiating mutations, and so the origin of the leukemia stem cell likely dictates prognosis and drug resistance. So how do we cure AML? I think that's the holy grail of all of cancers, and particularly AML is no exception to that. Again, the working hypothesis is that all leukemias arise from a leukemia stem cell, and the more primitive the leukemia stem cell is, the earlier it is in the stem cell lineage that acquired the mutations, the harder to eradicate the leukemia stem cell, and this ultimately leads to refractory disease and relapse disease. And the genetic features of AML really provide a clue for how primitive the leukemia is. And we'll get into a lot of that as the talk goes on here. So now shifting gears a little bit to the more practical implications of this disease, how do we diagnose AML? AML is diagnosed by 20% or more myeloblasts in the blood or bone marrow. Um, the blast percentage is irrelevant in two distinct subsets of AML, one core binding factor AML, termed CBF AML. These are two cytogenetic abnormalities um, that have a favorable uh, prognosis, and the myeloblast percentage is irrelevant in patients with these abnormalities, and the second one being APL. Uh, the morphology of myeloblasts are such that these cells have smooth chromatin, prominent nucleoli. You may or may not see hour rods, which are pathognomonic for uh, acute myeloid leukemia. This is a picture here uh, from a patient uh, with AML, and is a bone marrow biopsy, an example of a bone marrow biopsy. And you can see a homogeneous array of, of immature cells here, and all of these cells are myeloblasts. These pinkish cells are, are the, the red cell lineage, the red blood cell lineage. All of these myeloid cells are immature myeloblasts. Now, morphologically speaking, we get a bone marrow biopsy and we see a picture like this, or you can see these ugly cells in the peripheral blood as well. That does not define AML from other types of acute leukemia. So there is acute lymphoblastic leukemia and other 
types of leukemia that arise from different lineages of the white blood cells. So in order to differentiate AML from other types of acute leukemia, it is uh, necessary to look at the immunophenotype of the AML. The immunophenotype is typically done by flow cytometry where we look at the cell surface markers of all of the circulating cells, either in the bone marrow or blood. And in order to diagnose AML, we need to see specific myeloid antigens that describe these blasts as coming from the myeloid lineage. And I um, uh, presented some examples on this slide. It's not something that I would expect you to memorize. Um, but most of these patients have immature blast markers, such as CD34 and CD117. Epidemiologically speaking, AML is a fairly rare cancer. It's seen in about 18 to 20,000 new cases each year in the United States, and the incidence is actually rising year to year for unknown reasons. Um, most of these patients unfortunately die of their disease. About 10 to 12,000 patients die each year from AML in the United States. Um, someone put elderly when we asked one word that describes AML, and that's actually a good term because this is a disease of the elderly. Uh, the median age is about 67 to 68 years. All ages can be affected, however, and you can see that the incidence does increase as, we, as you get older. Um, but most patients, median age-wise, are diagnosed within that 65 uh, to 75-year age group. So how do these patients present? Um, uh, the, the symptoms of, and signs of AML are relatively nonspecific. I would say the, the majority of patients present with a rapidity of, of symptoms over one to two weeks, um, and these symptoms are related to the bone marrow failure state, such as these patients can be profoundly thrombocytopenic. They can present with mucosal bleeding, bruising, petechiae, and purpura. These patients are typically profoundly anemic and present with nonspecific symptoms of anemia, such as fatigue, malaise, weakness. And these patients can have a very high risk for infections due to the degree of being neutropenic and immunosuppressed. Um, we talked about the diagnosis of this disease by having 20% or more myeloblasts. This could be seen in the blood as well, but this, that the diagnosis of AML is largely done by a bone marrow biopsy. Um, if there are circulating blasts, so if there are immature cells in the peripheral blood, you, we can diagnose this by uh, flow cytometry. But ultimately, as we'll discuss in this slide here, the cytogenetics and the molecular mutations, the genetics of the leukemia are really critical. Um, about 10 years ago, and when I was in medical school, and not sure if they still teach this in medical school, but the classification of AML was largely done by the French-American-British classification, termed FAB. And the FAB classified AML into eight different subgroups, M0 through M7, and this was based solely on morphology and immunophenotype. But over the last 10, 20 years, we have really been able to un uh, dissect this disease into much more specific subgroups based on chromosomes and molecular mutations. And so the FAB classification is now outdated, and we don't really even use that anymore. And we now utilize uh, the World Health Organization classification as well as other risk scoring systems. One of the risk scoring systems that I um, like and utilize in my practice is the European Leukemia Net classification which was first um, devised in 2010. And in this um, classification group, there are four different risk groups that can be defined at diagnosis for an individual patient. Um, favorable, intermediate one, intermediate two, and adverse risk, as shown on the slide here. And this is based on the cytogenetics and molecular features at diagnosis. Uh, the take-home point of this slide here is that the incidence of favorable risk disease is, is, is more common in younger patients when compared to older patients. But in contrast, the uh, incidence of adverse risk disease is much more common in older patients compared to younger patients. So why does it matter what risk group these patients fall into? Well, we know that the risk groups are validated to predict outcome. And it, it, as you can see in this overall survival figure here, um, this is looking at younger patients, less than 60 years, with the different four different risk groups from the European Leukemia Net Group. And you can see the red line here represents the adverse risk 
patients with AML, and the median survival is less than a year for younger patients with adverse risk disease. And if you contrast that with favorable risk disease in blue, we have a 50 to 60 percent cure rate in these patients, long-term survival over 60 percent in these patients. And so the risk group at diagnosis is really critical for prognostication and ultimately therapeutic options. AML is a very heterogeneous disease, and this is not a one-size-fits-all diagnosis. This is actually an outdated uh, publication now a few years ago, which uncovered the most common mutations seen in AML. And the three co most common mutations in AML are NPM1, FLT3, and DNMT3A mutations. And this very complicated circos plot um, shows you all of the associations of each individual mutations with each other, such that NPM1 mutations, probably the most common mutation in AML, also has a high incidence of a co-occurrence with a DNMT3A mutation or a FLT3 mutation or even an IDH1 and IDH2 mutation. But it's even more complicated than that, and as we begin to dissect the pie chart into smaller pieces of the pie, you can see that there are um, uh, significant diversity of each individual small subdivision of AML. Uh, most recently, about now almost two years ago, um, uh, the largest genomic classification was performed in AML patients. This was uh, 1,540 patients were analyzed and, and genomically classified uh, by Papa Manuel and, and authors and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they found 11 distinct genomic classes of AML, which have distinct um, biology and clinical outcome. And again, the most common genomic group of AML are those with an NPM1 mutation. Now, I won't go through all of the classifications in detail, but this is just meant to emphasize that this is certainly complicated and we're beginning to understand smaller sub subgroups of AML. I think most importantly from this analysis um, were different abnormalities that uh, portended either a favorable or adverse outcome. And so they looked at all different cytogenetic and molecular abnormalities and, um, and, and in particular, if you look at inversion 3, which is a specific cytogenetic abnormality that is fairly rare, seen in about 1% of AML patients, this is the um, strongest negative um, uh, uh, impact factor in survival. And so the hazard ratio was the highest here for this cytogenetic abnormality. So patients diagnosed with an inversion 3 AML unfortunately have the worst overall outcome compared with any other abnormality. And these are patients that um, uh, do not do well with conventional treatments. The second most common or the second most uh, significant negative impact on survival are patients with a TP53 mutation seen in about 6% of AML patients, a little more common than inversion 3, also portending a very negative outcome. In contrast, there are some abnormalities that are more favorable in AML, and these are on the end of this figure here, NPM1 mutations, the most common mutation in AML seen in about a quarter of patients, um, favorable outcome, CEBP alpha, biallelic mutations, 5% of patients, favorable outcome. And those with APL and core binding factor also have favorable outcomes compared with other abnormalities. So at UNC, uh, we have a myeloid molecular panel, a next generation sequencing panel of 22 genes that we perform at diagnosis on all newly, uh, on all newly diagnosed AML patients. And you, these are the most common mutations seen in AML, and you can see that many of these mutations have either prognostic or therapeutic implications, but I think that this will continue to evolve over the next few years, and I think m many of these mutations may even have therapeutic implications as time goes on. So now we're going to get into some of the um, clinical management of AML. Um, we talked about the poor prognosis of this disease with conventional treatments. And if I needed to know only one factor, um, uh, one clinical characteristic of a patient with newly diagnosed AML, it would be age. Age um, is the strongest factor in overall prognosis. You can see in this figure here that the five-year survival drops off dramatically and when patients get older than 45 years old. Um, and we typically lump patients into two different age groups, either a younger 
or older population. And for the purposes of treatment and prognosis, younger patients are typically defined as, have, as being less than 65 years, and um, 65 years and over are typically defined as, have, uh, as the elderly AML patient population. And if you look at the difference in outcome, it's pretty dramatic. Those less than 65 have about a 40% five-year survival, whereas those 65 and over have less than 10%, very few long-term survivors. I want to focus first on this, the first figure here. Um, this is an overall survival curve of younger patients, less than 60-year-olds, um, who were diagnosed in the United Kingdom in the Medical Research Council group. And these were patients, this is an analysis of patients diagnosed from the 1970s to 2009. So each line represents different decades that patients were diagnosed with this disease. And you can see here, as time goes on, we have done much better in improving survival in these patients. So from 5% survival all the way up to close to 50% in 2009. But this is not due to the leukemia oncologists. This is the improvement in survival is largely due to the advancements in antibiotics and supportive care. We are now much better at being able to treat patients with infections and neutropenia. And it's also due to the refinement of allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is really providing a potential cure for many of these patients. That is the case until 2017, as we'll talk about, because we now have four new drugs approved for this disease, where I think the survival curves are going to start to increase because of the oncologists, because of us and um, all of the new agents in development. Now, if you contrast that to uh, older patients, and in this case we're talking about 60 years and over, we have not done uh, as good of a job in improving outcomes over time in these patients, and um, still looking at about a 10 to 20 percent long-term survival in this subgroup of patients. So the management of AML in 2018, again, we typically divide therapy into those for younger patients, um, loosely defined as less than 60 to 65 years versus those, those older patients of greater than 65 years. And the goal for younger patients and, and a subset of older patients is induction chemotherapy, intensive chemotherapy with the intent to induce a remission. That's why we call it induction chemotherapy. And the goal of induction chemotherapy is to achieve a complete remission. A complete remission, or CR, in AML is defined as having less than 5% blasts in the bone marrow. Um, it is an archaic definition from really the 1970s and may continue to evolve as um, more sensitive techniques are developed. Our standard uh, chemotherapy for younger and a subset of older patients has, has not changed since the 1970s, which is why I talked about the improvement in survival not because of the leukemia oncologist. 7 plus 3 is still the standard induction chemotherapy for, old, for younger and a subset of older patients, and this was first studied in the 1970s. However, uh, in the past year, we now have some new drugs approved that has added to 7 plus 3 or replaced 7 plus 3. Um, and here are the examples. Mitostorm, which is a FLT3 inhibitor, which we'll talk about, and is approved for frontline treatment with 7 plus 3 for newly diagnosed AML patients with a specific FLT3 mutation. CPX351 is a liposomal formulation of the same drugs in 7 plus 3, cytarabine and donorubicin, and a liposomal formulation that is approved for specific subgroups of patients. Gemtuzumab is an antibody to CD33, and it has a linker in it that kills cells with CD33, and CD33 is an early myeloid antigen, so most leukemias express CD33, and this is an agent approved with 7 plus 3, and finally, anacitinib, which is an IDH2 inhibitor, and we'll talk briefly about. So first, I'm going to talk about FLT3. Uh, FLT3 is a tyrosine kinase receptor um, and is, is responsible for regulating cell survival, signaling, and proliferation. FLT3 mutations are more or less the first or second most common mutation seen in AML. I think most studies suggest NPM1 mutations are the most common, and FLT3 mutations would be the second most common mutation, seen in about a quarter of patients. 
And there are two different types of FLT3 mutations, the most common being in ITD or internal tandem duplication. This is where base pairs are inserted into the FLT3 gene and renders the gene constitutively active. Patients with a FLT3 ITD mutation are typically younger patients, which are highly proliferative, have highly proliferative disease, most commonly have normal cytogenetics, and have a very high rate of relapse, whereas tyrosine kinase domain mutations much less common than ITD mutations and tend to have a more neutral prognosis. FLT3 mutations are actually thought to be a secondary driver of AML, and what that means is in the leukemogenesis of of uh, leukemia stem cells, FLT3 is thought to be a later mutation. It's not the first mutation that occurs in early hematopoietic stem cells. So once a FLT3 mutation occurs, it is typically driving the AML and leading to the disease after other earlier mutations. It does co-occur with a lot of other mutations. This figure here shows a tyrosine kinase map, and there are uh, uh, five different uh, FLT3 inhibitor drugs that have been studied and developed um, as FLT3 inhibitors. And what the red circles represent are different tyrosine kinase receptors that the drug targets. So the more red circles you see, the less specific the agent is for FLT3. And the big arrow here is where the FLT3 tyrosine kinase receptor is. So in order to, to have a very effective FLT3 inhibitor, you'd want a drug that is very potent, uh, at inhibiting the, the, the tyrosine kinase receptor in this arrow, and you don't want a lot of red circles because that means that the drug can have a lot of off-target effects and is nonspecific in its mechanism of action. We're going to talk about mitostorin, a FLT3 inhibitor. You can see here that it's relatively nonspecific, and I'll also tell you it's not very potent at inhibiting FLT3. So the clinical trial that led to the approval of mitostorin is called the RATIFY trial. Um, the RATIFY trial was a randomized phase 3 trial, the largest targeted clinical trial in AML. It was a randomized phase 3 trial of adding mitostorin to a standard of care 7 plus 3 versus 7 plus 3 with a placebo. And these were, this study was uh, done in younger patients, less than 60 years, with a FLT3 mutation. So you had to have an identifiable FLT3 mutation before enrolling on this study. Uh, those that achieved the response were then uh, able to receive mitostorin added to consolidation chemotherapy as standard of care as well as maintenance. There were 717 patients enrolled on this study, and the primary endpoint was actually overall survival, but initially what we saw was that the response rates were no different between mitostorin versus placebo, 59% versus 54%. But when you look at the overall survival, you can see that mitostorin led to a significant improvement in survival, 75 months versus 26 months with placebo. And because of the survival advantage, mitostorin was FDA approved in combination with 7 and 3 for newly diagnosed AML patients with a FLT3 mutation. And this is the first targeted agent approved for AML. Now, if you analyze this data in a little bit more detail, what, what this tells me is that the drug does not add to the responses of 7 and 3. So if a patient is destined to achieve a response to 7 and 3, they're going to achieve it with or without the addition of mitostorin, but probably what mitostorin is doing is deepening the response to allow patients to potentially be cured or uh, have a deeper response for further therapies. CPX351, um, this is again a liposomal formulation of the same drugs in 7 and 3, cytarabine and donorubicin that are in a synergistic molar ratio that is thought to um, be most effective at killing leukemia cells. Um, this was developed for really the last 20, 25 years, but ultimately a randomized phase 2 study was done in older patients, 60 to 75 year olds, and it was a randomized study between 7 and 3, or CPX351. And the idea was that this liposomal formulation was less toxic, potentially safer, and maybe better than 7 and 3 in older patients. CR rates were a little bit better with CPX351, 67% versus 51%. Not really a difference in survival, but when the, we looked at the subsets of patients in this trial between 60 and 75-year-olds, 
Secondary AML, those with pre-existing MDS or those who have had prior chemotherapy appear to have the most benefit with CPX351. And this led to a randomized phase 3 study of CPX351 versus 7 and 3 in newly diagnosed secondary AML patients, so only those with secondary AML in 60 to 75 year olds. There was another group of patients that were included in the study, which we'll talk about in the next slide, called AML with MDS-related changes. These are patients that may not necessarily have secondary AML, but biologically speaking are very similar to secondary AML patients. These are very high-risk AML patients that do horribly with conventional treatments. And what the study found in 309 patients was that CPX351 led to a significantly higher CR rate, close to 50% versus 33% with 7 and 3, and a significant improvement in survival, 9.6 months versus 5.9 months. And this led to the approval of CPX351 for first-line treatment of AML with MDS-related changes and treatment-related AML. Um, and this represents a new standard of care for an extremely high-risk AML patient population. Now again, um, it depends if you want to look at this with a half glass full or a half glass empty. This is certainly improving the bar compared with 7 plus 3, which I would argue was, was certainly a suboptimal therapy for these patients. But these, the, even with CPX351, the overall outcomes are poor. And so um, this represents a new standard of care, but something that we need to improve upon for future patients. AML with MDS-related changes is a new category that is recognized by the World Health Organization and can be defined by having any of these cytogenetic abnormalities. Um, so cytogenetics or chromosomal abnormalities um, we can uh, uh, uncover within 24 to 48 hours uh, um, within either bone marrow biopsy or from peripheral blood. And if we see any of these chromosomal abnormalities at diagnosis, this would be synonymous with AML with MDS-related changes, and CPX351 would be the standard of care. Now gemtuzumab. Gemtuzumab is a monoclonal antibody targeting CD33. CD33 is an immature myeloid antigen. Um, CD33 is expressed in AML patients probably 90 to 95% of the time, so most patients have increased expression of CD33. Um, and this drug is linked with a toxin called calichiomycin. So what happens is the antibody binds to CD33, injects the toxin, and kills the cell. And again, the leukemic cells typically express CD33. This is an old drug. So this drug was initially FDA approved in 2000 under the accelerated approval of the FDA uh, as a single agent for relapsed and refractory AML, but it was contingent on the company showing efficacy in a randomized phase three study because the accelerated approval in 2000 was based on a non-randomized single arm trial. It, the, the drug was eventually taken off the market in 2010 as the randomized phase three studies did not show the efficacy that they were hoping to see. Um, and the gemtuzumab doses that were used in the early 2000-2010 time period were much higher than are used now. So the drug was taken off the market in 2010, but the French group did a randomized phase 3 study called Alpha 0701, where they studied lower doses of gemtuzumab with the hope that they can mitigate some of the toxicity concerns from the prior trials, and they added it to the standard of care of 7 plus 3. So 7 plus 3 plus gemtuzumab, or, or GO, versus 7 plus 3 alone in newly diagnosed AML patients between the ages of 50 to 70. Um, those that had a response, gemtuzumab was again incorporated into consolidation chemotherapy. And similarly to the mitostorin story, not a real difference in, in complete remission, 81% versus 75%, but we did, they did see a survival and event-free survival advantage, significant advantage with gemtuzumab. And when you look at different subsets of patients, which is the figure here that I'm, I apologize is probably hard to discern, it's interesting that they found that those with favorable or intermediate risk cytogenetics had a significant survival advantage with gemtuzumab, 
but those with unfavorable or adverse risk cytogenetics had no benefit. So how does this drug fit into our therapeutic armamentarium in, uh, in 2018? This drug was reapproved for AML in 2017 in combination with 7 and 3. Lower doses of donorubicin were studied with gemtuzumab, so we would not recommend doses above 60 milligrams per meter squared. And favorable and intermediate risk patients benefit from the addition of gemtuzumab to 7 and 3, whereas adverse risk patients do not benefit. And I would not recommend this drug for anyone with adverse risk disease. Um, consolidation study on this trial included only two cycles of a high-dose cytarabine-like regimen. And our existing standard of care with 7 and 3 alone was four cycles of hydocytarabine. So it is unclear how the consolidation fits into our um, current repertoire with uh, four cycles of HIDAC. There are also some unanswered questions as to whether the lower doses of donorubicin studied with gemtuzumab are better equivalent or inferior to using 7 and 3 with high dose donorubicin, 90 milligrams per meter squared, which was our current standard of care prior to the approval of gemtuzumab. So I think this is an agent that is um, certainly worth using, but um, still unclear how best to utilize in specific patient populations. So as a summary of how to manage younger patients, again, we're talking about those less than 60 to 65 year olds with AML in 2018. Number one, I want to emphasize that clinical trials are still imperative. We went through some of the data and these drugs are certainly improving the bar of what we were seeing prior to 2017, but overall outcomes are still dismal in this disease and we need to continue to improve upon these treatments for the future. Treatment is individualized based on prognostic factors at diagnosis. So if we see a FLT3 mutation, we at UNC run a rapid assay for FLT3 mutation that is typically back in within two to four days. And if we see a FLT3 mutation, we would recommend 7 plus 3 plus mitostorm. If a patient has favorable or intermediate risk cytogenetics, Again, information that we would be getting within one to two days after a bone marrow biopsy, and they do not have a FLT3 mutation, and they are between the ages of 50 to 70 years, I would recommend 7 plus 3 plus gemtuzumab. If a patient has the same characteristics but is less than 50 years, I think that it is reasonable to either use 7 plus 3 plus high-dose donorubicin or 7 plus 3 plus gemtuzumab. We just do not have the randomized trials in this very young patient population. If a patient has treatment-related AML, AML with MDS-related changes, that's MRC, or secondary AML from pre-existing MDS, then I would recommend CPX351. And if a patient has adverse risk AML, there, that does not fit into any of these prior categories, there really is no standard of care and I believe that this is the patient population that should be emphasized for clinical trials. And I think as a outside of clinical trials, the options would be 7 plus 3 versus the addition of cladribine to 7 plus 3. I suspect that treatment algorithms will continue to evolve as more targeted therapies are, uh, are, are, are uh, studied and, and selective agents are utilized. So, I'm going to shift gears in, in the next minute or two, talk about an agent in development. This is not FDA approved for AML that I have been uh, studying for the last several years, a, an investigational agent known as Alvocidib. Alvocidib is a potent CDK9 inhibitor. CDK9 regulates RNA polymerase II and thereby regulates the transcriptions of proteins. Alvocidib in sequential combination with chemotherapy uh, such as cytarabine and mitoxantrone, two standard cytotoxic agents, um, the sequence known as FLAM, alvocidib followed by cytarabine and mitoxantrone, has been studied in quite a bit of for over 400 AML patients in both newly diagnosed and relapsed refractory disease. And I was fortunate to lead a multi-center randomized trial comparing FLAM with alvocidib versus 7 and 3 in newly diagnosed AML patients. These were 18 to 70 year olds, so these the study encompassed both younger and older patients with AML. And we found significantly higher CR rates with FLAM 
compared with seven and three, but we did not see an overall survival advantage with phlegm. And the question is, can we better refine who is going to be treated with alvocative to better predict who may, who may respond to this agent? So we are very interested in predictive biomarkers of response of this agent. Um, by inhibiting CDK9 and RNA polymerase 2, alvocative is a potent inhibitor of an anti-apoptotic peptide known as MCL1. And what we did is we took bone marrow samples from those that were studied on that trial, FLAM versus 7 and 3, and we looked at those that got a response versus those that did not get a response to alvocative. And we found that those that had a high NOXA priming score um, had a significantly higher response rate compared with those that had a low NOXA priming score. So what exactly is NOXA? NOXA is a pro-apoptotic peptide that antagonizes MCL1. And if you have a high NOXA priming score, that means that cells are, the leukemia cells are dying with the addition of NOXA. And it suggests that those leukemia cells are dependent on the MCL1 pathway. So we are uh, uh, leading a phase two study here at UNC studying FLAM, alvocative, followed by cytarabine and mitoxantrone in those with newly diagnosed and relapsed refractory AML with a high NOXA priming score. We're also studying this agent in combination with 7 and 3 in newly diagnosed AML patients, and I'm very excited about the prospects of this agent moving forward. In the next five minutes or so, I'm going to talk about elderly AML. I'm only dedicating a few minutes to this, although I believe this is the biggest conundrum in AML, as there is no standard of care and really a lack of effective therapeutic options for older patients with this disease. We talked about the um, poor outcomes. Um, the poor outcomes are largely due to increased toxicity and mortality with the intensive treatments that we give younger patients, higher rates of adverse risk features in, in older patients, and more aggressive disease biology. Management of elderly AML is, is the optimal man management is a key area of research. There is no standard of care. We typically first identify whether a patient is fit or unfit for intensive chemotherapy. Now, the fitness of a patient largely is very subjective in clinical practice, but there are some objective scores that can be utilized, one being the augmented transplant comorbidity index that Mohamed Saroor and colleagues in the University of Washington have studied. Secondly, we want to obtain diagnostic and prognostic information from the bone marrow and from their, from their peripheral blood as adverse risk patients do poorly with intensive chemotherapy, so we want to weed them out early. And finally, clinical trials are really imperative in this patient population. So, uh, how do we manage these patients? Intensive chemotherapy, similar to the agents I just discussed, can be given to select fit elderly patients. Favorable risk patients respond best. Which agents do we recommend? CPX351, which I just described, is a standard of care for newly diagnosed secondary AML patients, but they have to be fit. Um, and so if a patient is fit to receive intensive chemotherapy and has secondary AML, or AML with MDS-related changes up to the age of 75, CPX351 is very reasonable. 7 plus 3 is also a reasonable option for select patients who are favorable risk. I would not recommend high-dose donorubicin for these patients, and we would add gemtuzumab to 7 plus 3 as long as the patient is less than 70 years. Hypomethylating agents. Azacitidine or decitabine, these are lesser intensive outpatient-based strategies, um, no need for hospitalization, less toxicity. And I think these agents can be given to fit or unfit patients, and we'll talk about the data of these agents. There are lower rates of responses, but unclear difference if, in overall survival with these agents versus more intensive strategies. Gemtuzumab. Uh, is also approved as a single agent in unfit elderly patients. I don't tend to use it because I think hypomethylating agents um, have better efficacy. And finally, lotocytarabine, again, an agent that I sparingly use for this patient population. So first I'm going to talk about azacitidine. This is a hypomethylating agent, a 
uh, a, a lower intensity strategy that we give in the outpatient setting. And there was a randomized phase three international trial and 65 years and over, so elderly patients with 30% or more bone marrow blasts. And they were randomized to receive either azacitidine or physician's choice. Physician's choice on this study was actually divided into either best supportive care, so no chemotherapy, uh, low-dose cytarabine, which is um, really low intensity, not effective chemotherapy, or intensive chemotherapy with seven and three. So the physician would choose which of those three options they recommended, and then azacitidine would be randomized against each of those three strategies. And it turns out that the overall survival was improved with azacitidine when you compare to all three of the other subgroups together. But I think what is most relevant for this discussion is what about the patients that were pre-selected to receive intensive chemotherapy? So the FIT patients, is there a difference between azacitidine versus intensive chemo in FIT patients? And when you look at that subset, this was a subset from this study, there was no difference in overall survival, 13 months with azacitidine versus 12 months with 7 and 3. Those response rates were half with azacitidine, 28% versus 50%. So I think what this tells us is that despite a patient potentially being fit to receive 7 and 3 or similar chemotherapy, not sure that there is a benefit versus azacitidine, and azacitidine is a reasonable first-line option. Decitabine is a very similar drug to azacitidine and has also been studied in the randomized phase 3 setting. Um, and this was compared against physician's choice. This was not intensive chemotherapy based, so it was either best supportive care or low-dose cytarabine in older patients. And the median survival was 7.7 .7 months with decitabine versus 5 months with the control arm. Didn't quite reach sig statistical significance, thereby did not lead to FDA approval. We can still use decitabine off-label, um, uh, but response rates are quite low, 18%. And so it is not an optimal strategy for these patients. Decitabine has been studied in more aggressive formats like 10 days instead of 5 days with more promising results, which I won't discuss today. There are a number of exciting options that are being studied in combination with hypomethylating agents, either azacitidine or decitabine, some of which we are um, participating in, in leading clinical trials here at UNC. Um, I'm particularly interested in immunotherapeutic strategies added to azacitidine, and we have a phase two study here of azacitidine plus pembrolizumab, a monoclonal antibody targeting PD-1 in newly diagnosed elderly AML patients. Relapse refractory AML, I'm going to um, spend just a minute on this slide here because unfortunately there is no standard of care for relapse refractory AML. Um, the majority of patients, younger or older, who achieve a complete remission ultimately relapse and, and unfortunately die of their disease. And, and once patients have relapse and refractory disease, outcomes are extremely poor. And so their treatment for relapse refractory disease is typically divided into salvage intensive strategies versus lower intensity treatments. Um, we are leading a study here studying uh, an intensive strategy with hydocytarabine followed by pembrolizumab, a monoclonal antibody targeting PD-1 in relapse refractory AML patients. And we're very excited about the prospects of this agent in conjunction with, with intensive chemotherapy for relapse refractory AML. Uh, a minute on IDH2, uh, on anacitinib and an IDH2 inhibitor. So IDH2 mutations are seen in about 8 to 10 percent of AML patients. They're probably the fifth or sixth most common mutation seen in AML. There are two different types of IDH2 mutations, but I think that that's less important. And there is an oral drug called enacitinib, which is a first-in-class IDH2 inhibitor that was studied in a phase one slash two study. So it was a single-arm study, non-randomized, giving enacitinib uh, in relapsed refractory AML patients with an IDH2 mutation. So these are patients who are heavily pretreated. And the drug uh, was deemed to be safe, tolerable, minimal toxicities, and had a CR rate of about, of about 20% with about a 40% overall response rate, um, which led to the approval of this drug given the toxicity profile. Um, and so this was FDA approved in August 2017. 
So where do we go from here? Um, there are multiple multitude of new agents being explored in AML, and I think we're just beginning to understand how best to treat small subsets of patients. Um, I think predictive biomarker strategies are promising, and we're moving away from a one-size-fits-all treatment paradigm. I think immunotherapeutic strategies represent a promising avenue of exploration in AML. And this is an old slide from a big review of AML in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, which shows all of the different agents, more promising agents, being studied for this disease. And this is now outdated. I think that if this, uh, if we published a similar review now, this would be double um, what was being studied a few years ago. So I think the future is bright for this disease. So I'm going to get back to the case here. Um, Again, this is a patient with secondary AML, so previously treated chemo, uh, uh, head and neck cancer with chemo and radiation, now with newly diagnosed high-risk AML. And the question again is, how do we manage this patient? I think before, some of you said 7 plus 3 or 7 plus 3 plus mitostorin, and I'm interested to see if some of you will now change your answer. All right, so if you take just a minute, uh, go ahead and uh, text, or, or if you're on the website uh, for Poll Everywhere, go ahead and submit that. Um, a, B, C, D, or E, just go ahead and uh, indicate which you think would be the, the correct answer at this point. we got one correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big hit. We did, I, I'll warn you, I, I, we ran into a problem with poll everywhere. I mentioned earlier we had, uh, well, we're having some sort of a, uh, what we believe is a network-related issue that caused us to have to do a few workarounds today. Uh, that may be causing some of your poll everywhere responses not to go through, and so I'm going to give you another workaround in just a moment here uh, when it comes to asking questions of Dr. Zeidner. So we'll, we'll show you that in just a moment here. But uh, we'll, we'll assume that, that at this point everyone knows that C is the answer. Although I think uh, azacitidine D is a, is a reasonable answer as well, which is why I said there may be two right answers. Um, but uh, I think the best correct answer is CPX351, um, certainly um, better than the other three. So. Uh, in conclusion, AML is a challenging disease to treat, um, a very heterogeneous disease with diverse genetic subsets. Um, AML patients have a poor prognosis. Um, we have had four new agents that are very exciting that have been approved for this disease in, in 2017. Prior to that, the last approval was in 2000, which was then taken off the market, and prior to that was 1990. So we're now seeing an, a surge of new agents approved for this disease. Um, standard treatments are still unsatisfactory, and I think that prompt referral to highly specialized cancer centers is warranted with this disease, and clinical trials are imperative in all facets. And with that, I guess we'll take questions, and um, uh, thank you for your time and, and interest. Great. So let me, I'm going to advance this one more. If you can, uh, if, if you are able to go ahead and submit questions here, please go ahead. But we realize that for some reason, Poll Everywhere, it's not accepting everyone's questions. So if you're joining us in Zoom, you can go ahead and uh, there's a place at the, at the bottom of Zoom there where it says chat, and you can just click on chat, and it, it will add, there's a place where you can say we'll be seen by panelists. Go ahead and submit your questions there, and we'll go ahead and, and take those. Uh, it looks like they are starting to come through. And part of it may just be a delay. But you can go ahead and submit the questions via Zoom. And while we're waiting for the, you can also email unccn at unc.edu, and we can take questions that way as well. So you've got thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, Vijay uh, Chaudhary at East Carolina University has a couple of questions. I want to go ahead and start yeah. with those. So we're, uh, we're struggling with risk classification for newly diagnosed AML in a timely manner, which leads to initiation of therapy with 7 and 3, which I've been postulating not to consider standard for all patients. You mentioned the turnaround at UNC of one to two days, and I would like to learn more about the streamlined process. It's not a problem to incorporate mitostorin on day 8. Um, right, so what you're referring to is 
um, whether you need such a rapid turnaround in order to add Mitostorin on day eight. I think that that's a fair point. The reason why we typically um, run the rapid FLT3 assay prior to starting therapy is that we tend to use high-dose donorubicin in patients who um, uh, otherwise are younger without a FLT3 mutation. And if we know they have a FLT3 mutation and we're going to use mitostorin, we uh, utilize 60 milligrams per meter squared, which is the, the study dose on, on the RATIFY trial. Um, what's your turnaround for the NOXA assay? It's about 48 hours, um, so it's fairly quick. We get the results uh, fairly quickly in order to determine whether they're eligible. Um, Question, if heterogeneous genetically, by what criteria is AML considered a clonal? If clonal, what are the common mutations and are they driver mutations? Yet, Yes, AML is definitely clonal. Um, the most common mutations are NPM1 mutations, FLT3 mutations, and DNMT3A mutations. They all tend to be driver, those mutations tend to be driver mutations, although DNMT3A is very interesting since this is also a mutation seen in what we term CHIP, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So I don't think DNMT3A is, is, is sufficient to lead to leukemogenesis without other coexisting mutations. But NPM1 and FLT3 are considered drivers of this disease. Um, I've missed it, but what is the average life expectancy for newly diagnosed patient of the average age? So it depends on the risk groups. So it's, again, we're moving away from a one-size-fits-all diagnosis and treatment. Um, and and in, if a patient has adverse risk disease, the average life expectancy is about 9 to 12 months. If they have favorable risk disease, th these patients have a 60% chance of cure and have a, a life expectancy of 5 to, to 10 years. So I really like to um, pigeonhole based on the actual uh, risk classification as opposed to an uh, average life expectancy for all patients. Um, thank you for your informative talk. While work has mainly focused on somatic mutations, have there been efforts looking at germline mutations and treatment options? It's a very um, interesting question. Um, there are not a lot of genetic inheritance, uh, inheritable uh, AML syndrome. So what I mean by that is germline mutations and or um, uh, patients born with genetic uh, um, deficiencies or genetic mutations don't tend to get AML. There are rare exceptions to that, and there are some familial cases of AML, but these are extremely rare and um, not something that I have a lot of experience with. So most of these, all of these mutations tend to really be somatic. Um, what are suspect genes on chromosome 7? It's a good question. Um, I, I don't think we know that. Um, uh, there are no genes uh, that I'm aware of on chromosome 7 that otherwise drive this disease. But chromosome, the question is, because chromosome 7 is an adverse risk uh, abnormality if you have either a monosomy chromosome 7 or a deletion of a portion of chromosome 7, but I'm not sure exactly what genes are on chromosome 7 that leads to the disease. All right. Oh, and one, I think we have time for one more question here. Does MRD play a role in AML patients going to transplant? Absolutely. So MRD is minimal residual disease. We have much more specific sensitive ways to detect leukemia other than the classic bone marrow morphology, and it does play a role in patients going to transplant because we know that those that have MRD that go to transplant do worse than if they go to transplant without MRD. So we try very hard to get rid of MRD prior to transplant. Sometimes that is challenging, and so there are times we still send patients to transplant with minimal residual disease, um, but it is certainly an evolving area where we are trying to better understand the best patients for transplant. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to our audience. These are great questions. I apologize we had some trouble with Poll Everywhere, but thank you to those of you who were able to get those to us, and we'll certainly have that fixed by the next lecture. Uh, we do want to also thank the UCRF, the University Cancer Research Fund, uh, UNC Leinberger. We want to thank the General Assembly for their generous support of both of these. Uh, we want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the hard work they do to make this and every one of our lectures possible. Coming up, uh, June 13, 2018, RNN Allied Health Lecture, Breast Imaging Technologies, Cancer Detection, and Personalized Medicine with Dr. Kuzmiak. Uh, then on June 27th, 
2018, uh, noon for both of these, our next medical and surgical oncology lecture, using biomarkers to plan adjuvant therapy in breast cancer, and the speaker is Dr. Carey. So uh, two great lectures coming up. Uh, check out unccn.org slash events for information on all of our upcoming lectures. Uh, at unccn.org, you'll also be able to visit our learning portal. And uh, if you were not, if you have a colleague who wasn't able to attend Dr. Zeidner's lecture today, she or he can go and log on to the portal, watch the lecture, take an assessment, and receive credit there. So, uh, and that will be available for one year. We have, I think this will make uh, 14 lectures that are now available as enduring materials. We'll be up to 24 by the end of the year, and then we'll just keep uh, 24 in circulation at any given time. You can also watch the lectures without receiving credit, lots of other information, unccn.org. All right, I think we're, we're done. So thank you, Dr. Zeidner. Really appreciate you being here. This has been a great lecture. Uh, thank you so much to our audience. We appreciate it, and we'll see you soon.